Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we pray that you may open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your word, that we may truly receive your living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're a small crowd. That's an oxymoron, by the way. Small crowd. Um, the reason why I'm using the readings for this coming Sunday, A, it helps me prepare for this coming Sunday, but also I wasn't expecting to preach on Sunday, but Shane has decided because it's his 24th wedding anniversary with Estelle, that he would like to sit in church with her. So um, I'd already put in motion the fact that I was going to preach on Sunday's reading today so that I could record it and etc. But that's not really the point. The readings today have a lot to do with calling and the whole, um, the whole point leading up to the middle of February and we celebrate Ash Wednesday deals with our calling. And actually that's our diocesan theme as well. It deals with our calling and encounter, then a conversation with Jesus and then putting out into deep water and letting down our nets for a catch. And this is exactly what happens in the encounter with Philip. Philip meets Jesus, he has a conversation with him, and through that conversation he is converted, and then he goes off and he finds his friend Nathaniel. And I've used the phrase quite often in, um, in, in, our, in my sermons about come and see. And Nathaniel comes after being a little bit skeptical. Yeah, well, can anything good come from Nazareth? Um, Nathaniel comes and meets Jesus, and he also is converted. And of course, you know what it is to be a disciple. It ultimately, for, most, for the most part of the inner 12, I think only one, maybe two, survived in the end. All of them died violent deaths. And that is about putting out into deep water. But there's... That violent death thing, I want to use an image. Um, all of you have been to um, a restaurant like the Spur or maybe even Wimpy. I see Wimpy's got those nice jungle gyms now. Um, and if we're really tired of children, we sit as far away as possible from those things. I have, niece, I have an, a couple of nie uh, a niece and a few nephews. Um, and I was thinking yesterday... Um, about them playing and I think we've all heard children when they're playing saying you ain't seen nothing yet for a mother the phrase you ain't seen nothing yet can be quite horrifying because it usually means that the child or children are doing something like hanging upside down on one of those jungle gyms um, that they had climbed pretty high to reach in the first place or daring each other um, to eat something totally disgusting to human beings. However, if the child who throws down this proverbial gauntlet of you ain't seen nothing yet is successful in doing something extraordinary, whether it's safe or not, well that kid can gain a lot of respect from the others. I lived a fairly sheltered life, so I didn't do stupid things like that. Um, but I do love climbing trees. I still do today. I, I do, when I go to retreats and things, I always go and sit up in a tree somewhere. Uh, maybe, maybe it's my evolution that hasn't quite come to f fullness. The thing is, that's kids' stuff. Um, but, then again, maybe that's almost what Jesus was saying to Nathaniel in the gospel reading I just read to you a moment ago he says do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree and then he goes on to say you'll see greater things than these truly I tell you you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man Nathaniel has just been surprised that Jesus recognized him at all. 
But then Jesus says, in a manner of speaking, you think that's amazing. You ain't seen nothing yet. For us, this image of angel, angel traffic between heaven and earth might at first seem pleasant, perhaps a little sweet, vaguely reminiscent of Jacob's ladder in Genesis, and we can all remember being in Sunday school, drawing the pictures and coloring the pictures of angels. Notice that they always ascend and then descend. Hey? They never descend and then ascend. It's always ascend first. The thing is, this image probably uh, immediately meant something far deeper to Nathaniel. He, he would have known very well the Old Testament story of Jacob's dream, where Jacob saw a ladder reaching to heaven with angels going up and down and up and down. Um, and Nathaniel might also have noticed the difference in the image that Jesus used. Jesus said the angels were going up and down, not on a ladder, but on the Son of Man. A subtle but very, very, very important difference. In both cases, the image of angelic traffic, if you like, points to the connection between heaven and earth, the connection between God and God's creatures. But in the image Jesus used, that connection between God and us resides in the person of Jesus. Jacob's dream becomes very personal for us. In my mind, this is good news. This connection, because um, Jesus' challenge to Nathaniel comes in the midst of Jesus gathering his disciples, and Nathaniel is welcome to join the group. Today, we might say it was his call to ministry. Nathaniel, an, in, an, an Israelite without guile, has evidently been a faithful Jew who probably studied the Torah with great seriousness. But Jesus is saying, there's more. And I think Jesus is saying that to us as a community at the moment, there's more. For the last 18 months, I have felt that this community of Trinity, and specifically the Anglican component, has been on the verge of something great. There's something more. Nathaniel can go even deeper into an understanding of what Torah calls him to. He can learn even more about God. And Jesus' mission is to show God's people who God is. The encounter and conversation with Jesus put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. I think this is very good news. This connection between heaven and earth, this connection between God and God's people, it's not a new connection. It didn't begin with the coming of Jesus. Our Old Testament passage set for Sunday, which we read this morning, um, is also a call to ministry. It's so easy to love that story of the boy Samuel. Again, we've got childish notions of that because the most endearing stories that we learn in, from our childhood and in Sunday school fashion, we carry into our adulthood. We love to picture that little boy Samuel waking his teacher Eli because he heard someone calling him a mistake in identity. Go back to bed, Eli keeps saying, until he finally figures out that perhaps the Lord is calling Samuel. That inexplicable voice 
After Eli tells Samuel what to say the next time he heard the voice, we might imagine that Eli was thinking, in a manner of speaking, well, my child, you ain't seen nothing yet. And maybe Eli didn't know either that maybe he was going to be told, you ain't seen nothing yet. And indeed, if we had continued to read the extended reading for Sunday, Samuel was given a very difficult job for someone so young. The job of speaking God's truth to Eli and about what was going on in his family. From the beginning, God has offered this connection between heaven and earth to God's people. The ladder has always been there. The means to encounter and converse with God by living as godly people has always been there. It's we, ourselves, as a community, as individuals within the community, who have failed to see it or even, dare I say, we've ignored it. You know, uh, uh, uh. we hear this voice and we know that actually God is prompting us to go in a certain direction and we think, no, wait, this is too difficult. There's a book called The Dream of God by Verna Dozier and she writes, um, both the people of the Torah and the people of the resurrection we're escaping from God's awesome invitation to be something new in the world. And we Anglicans are very good at holding on to the old, but we're not so good at grabbing on to the new. This connection to God means we must constantly be open to newness, to being renewed, to seeing in new ways every day the needs of God's people around us, to being open to the new directions our spiritual lives may go if we dare to become that proverbial ladder that angels ascend and descend on. Can we even go there? I wonder. Believe me, it's very difficult. Could we ever presume to be so connected to God that we could take that very creative image of ladders and angels and say our, ex and say our example of godly living might become a ladder for others? I hope so. Because that is, I think, what God offered Jacob in his dream and what Jesus offered Nathaniel in his face-to-face -face encounter and conversation with him. This makes sense if we remember that Jesus constantly reminded his followers and so us that what he was doing, they and us would have to continue that doing. So if we do dare, it will be an adventure. A few years ago, she was more than a decade ago now. Um, I went with my group scout master and the rover scout leader um, on a tour of England. It was quite a whistle stop tour. It was basically a week and we went from almost um, Penzance all the way up to Land's End and um, back again in kind of a week. It was a bit worse and we went via Wales. Um, so it was, it was a worse trip. I mean, it was like Russia, rush there, rush there. Uh, but we stopped at, um, in Bath and uh, the Abbey Church in Bath on the facade of the church are two humongous ladders carved in stone and stretching from the top of the front doors to the roof. And on that carving 
are a number of angels on the ladder. But it's quite an interesting crowd of angels. Most are intent on climbing upward. But several of them are looking over their shoulders like this. Um, as if to encourage those that are coming up behind them. There are one or two, however, on each ladder that seem to have gotten turned completely around and look as if they're hanging, hanging on the ladder by their toes, upside down, sort of monkeying around, if you like. They're wonderfully strange angels, but they're also strangely comforting for us. Daring to be that ladder ourselves doesn't mean we'll always be perfect or we'll always get it right. Nathaniel probably wasn't always perfect in his ministry as one of Jesus' disciples. Lord knows that the disciples are really a motley crew. Samuel himself probably wasn't always perfect in his ministry as one of God's prophets. We won't always be perfect in our own vocations. And each one of us has a vocation, not just of us that wear funny clothes. We're not always going to get it right. Some days we might feel like we're not much of a ladder. But those are the days we must remember that Jesus' mission was to show us who God is and how much God loves us. In another great hymn, um, when Jesus went to Jordan Stream, um, the words, the triune God is thus made known in Christ as love unending. It's not a hymn we sing in this parish, but it is one that we, that Anglicans like to sing. In love, God offers us reconciliation. In love, God offers us a chance to right ourselves and to continue in our work of building up God's kingdom. Like we said last Sunday, we participate in the mission, in God's mission. The Missio Ecclesia, that's the mission of the church, is actually God's mission, Missio Dei. In other words, our lives are to become increasingly an epiphany of God so that we can help others encounter and converse with our Lord so that they may be empowered to put out into deep water and let down their nets for a catch. Amen.